So uh, I want to report on advances in algebraic quantum field theory. Of course, this will cover only a very small part of algebraic quantum field theory. And you should know that algebraic quantum field theory is now a rather old subject, more than 60 years old. So I would like today to present older things and come to newer developments in the next lectures. So the question one uh, can ask at the beginning is, if you want to do physics, you usually look at certain physical systems, which are not everything, not the whole universe, but parts of a larger system. And the question is always in which sense this is justified to uh, treat a physical system without looking at uh, its uh, relations to a larger system. So the first question one can ask is, what is a good subsystem? Uh, good is, of course, something which has to be qualified. And once you understand in which sense a system is a subsystem of a larger system, you can also ask the question, what are the relations to other other subsystems, and there are several kinds of relations one might look at, for instance, independent systems or systems which determine each other. There can be correlations or even entanglement. Now, one often sees that uh, subsystems are characterized by their material content. So you, fin you can find phrases like a system consisting of two electrons. But this characterization of subsystems is problematic for several reasons. One reason comes from relativistic physics, where you have uh, particle creation and particle annihilation. And so particle number is not well defined during interaction. But of course, interaction is everywhere and all time. So, so in the sense, particle number is not a really well-defined concept in general. Another uh, problem is that when you look at a system of, say, n particles, and these are, say, bosons or fermions, and you consider them as part of a system of m particles, where m is larger than n, you see that this makes not really sense because there is no way to characterize the n particles in an m particle system. And a striking example where this becomes relevant is the Hanbury Brown twist effect, where you observe photons coming from different sources, so for instance, stars quite, or galaxies quite far away from us. And nevertheless, the photons are entangled, in spite of the fact that their emission process was completely uncorrelated. It was, I think, a basic insight of Rudolf Haag. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. There's a question here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question is about this effect. Can you explain a bit more about it? Oh, uh, so um, the the effect is that you you see photons. You you, you uh, observe light from stars, which are more or less in the same position, but, uh, in the same direction. And uh, then you find correlations between these light, and this can be can be understood classically if you look at the behavior of an electromagnetic wave. But when you try to understand it in quantum physics, then you have to take into, into account that photons are, are bosons, so the wave function is always symmetric. 
this leads to some correlations or even entanglement. There's a similar effect for fermions, which is also known. And this plays a role in astronomic observations, but I'm not a specialist in this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I uh, come to this uh, starting point of algebraic quantum field theory, which was the Lille lecture of Rudolf Haag in 1957, where he pro uh, made the proposal that one should look at algebras of observables measurable in some finitely extended region of space-time. And these turned out to be good subsystems in a certain sense. Now, of course, when you uh, characterize systems by, not by the material content, but by their localization in space and time, then you need, of course, an a priori notion of space-time. So one cannot expect that this concept remains valid in quantum gravity. So it's not clear at the moment uh, how this uh, uh, whole framework uh, changes if you really do quantum gravity. But as long as you are uh, treating um, gravity as an external force, then this works quite well and this I will explain in detail. And it turned out that this seemingly harmless assumption uh, covers the essence of relativistic quantum field theory. So I will explain this in more detail. So the one aspect you directly see why it's so, so uh, good in the relativistic context is because, because of the finite velocity of light, these systems characterizing by, characterized by space-time region is in a certain sense stable. So the region uh, extends only a finite amount uh, in space in a finite time. So when you apply the same principle to non-relativistic physics, then uh, it's um, not so easy and actually there's a problem when you want to have interesting time evolution for such a system then it's not clear uh, that uh, a system characterized in this way um, uh, that is good to characterize the system in this way. Actually, there are no gold theorems by Nanhofer and Turing that for bosonic systems, uh, it's uh, under certain condition not possible to do the time evolution. But there's a recent work of Buchholz the so-called resolvent algebra, where he defines the algebra in a certain way, which is then stable under typical interactions. But this I don't want to discuss in more detail. Instead, I concentrate on the relativistic case. Now, uh, this can be, the concept can be made precise in the so-called haag kastler axioms. And what is this concept? So we have a quantum system, so the quantum system is here represented by a C-star algebra with unit. Um, just to remind you what a C-star algebra is, this is just an associative algebra of the complex numbers with an antilinear involution corresponding to taking the adjoint. And crucial condition is that this algebra has a norm which satisfies this condition that the norm of A star A is equal to the square of the norm of A. This is a property of the norm, operator norm for Hilbert space operators and can be, uh, uh, can be used as an abstract criterion for this C star algebra. And then an additional condition is that the algebra is complete with respect to the induced topology. Now, these, uh, these are mathematically very nice objects. Um, from the point of physics, it's uh, important that they are isomorphic to non-closed algebras of Hilbert space operators. So, in the sense, it's um, um, on the first moment, one could say, well, it's the same as doing quantum physics on a Hilbert space. 
But there is one big difference, namely a sister algebra in, uh, typically admits mutually inequivalent representations. So it has not a, it can be isomorphically represented on a Hilbert space, but this, it has uh, different representations which have quite different properties, and this is also relevant for physics. So the theory is then defined in terms of an association of algebras to space-time regions. So each region O is mapped to some algebra A of O. Uh, of course, one can then ask which regions one should consider, whether one should uh, have uh, all regions. So typically, one looks at uh, regions of a special form, uh, for instance, so-called so double cones. So this is just the intersection of the past and the future uh, of two, uh, the, the past of one point intersected with the future of another point. So all uh, points which can be reached by a causal curve connecting two points. Um, and then, um, but uh, I don't want to discuss this in too much detail, so just uh, consider O as, as a sufficiently nice region. Now then, we have this association of uh, regions to algebras, the so-called Haag-Kastler net, and it is assumed to satisfy the conditions. First, the condition that the smaller region is the sub region of the latter region leads to the idea that the algebra of A of O1 is the algebra of O2, is contained in the algebra of A of two, O2, and this inclusion means also that the unit, so these are these are algebras with the unit, and the unit of the smaller algebra is also the unit of the larger algebra. This is the inclusion of subsystems, so this looks rather obvious from a mathematical point of view. Then there is the relativistic uh, rule that systems which are space-like separated from each other don't influence each other. This is expressed by the law of local commutativity. So you have two sub-regions, O1, O2 of a region O, and O1 is space-like separated from O2. Then the commutator is an element of the algebra of O, and the condition is that the commutator has to vanish for all elements uh, A1 in the algebra A of O1, and A2 in the algebra of A of O2. And the third axiom is the covariance axiom, so if you have a space-time which has certain symmetries, so symmetry means that the structure is preserved, the structure is the, the, the metric and the causal orientation. So uh, you uh, have also to, to uh, look for symmetries which keep the time orientation. And then, so this would be in the case of the Poincaré group, we would look at the connected component of the unit. And then uh, each such uh, symmetry uh, corresponds to some isomorphism from the algebra of the region O to the algebra of the region of the uh, image region L applied to O, and this should be this isomorph these isomorphisms should be consistent in the sense that if I restrict them to a subalgebra corresponding to another region, then this is the isomorphism of the smaller region, and moreover, when you perform two such symmetry operations, one after the other, you have this composition law. Okay, so this is a fairly small set of axioms, and it has already a lot of consequences. Now, what about states? So states, in the algebraic sense, are positive linear functionals, typically called omega, and they uh, are normalized in the sense that uh, on the unit they take the value 1, 
and physically these uh, functionals uh, correspond to the expectation value of some observable. Then, as I already mentioned, you can represent these star algebras in Hilbert spaces. So such a Hilbert representation is some homomorphism of the algebra in the algebra of bounded operators on some Hilbert space. And then for, for each such uh, state, you can construct a Hilbert space, a representation, and a distinguished unit vector this so-called GNS construction after Gelfand, Neimark, and Siegel, such that the expectation value in the sense, algebraic sense of states is the same as the expectation value in this uh, Hilbert space sense of space. And if you use this formula, you can reconstruct this uh, Hilbert space and the representation immediately. So this is quite uh, uh, simple to do this. But nevertheless, very important. Now, uh, when we uh, apply this framework to Minkowski space, actually for uh, uh, several uh, years, this was mainly the only thing which was done, apply this formula to Minkowski space. Then one can use Poincaré symmetry for the interpretation of states. So, so if we have a state which is invariant under the Poincaré group and has positive energy, then we call this state a vacuum. Of course, the name vacuum is a little bit misleading because uh, the state does not say that the um, system is empty. Yeah, so. Um, actually, we have a lot of activity in the vacuum, as we know from the Casimir effect or from vacuum fluctuations and so on. So, but traditionally, one calls this a vacuum. Then one can look at the G induced GNS representation. So we have a vacuum Hilbert space, a vacuum representation, and a vacuum vector, and. Then, on this Hilbert space, one can find a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. And this, uh, one can then look at possible representation of the Poincaré group, and in particular look at irreducible representations. And the idea is that irreducible representation correspond to particles. So the, these, uh, state vectors in an irreducible representation are interpreted as particle states. Now, there is one of the big uh, um, the successes of algebraic quantum field theory in the first uh, years. Actually, this was one of the motivation for invent the whole formalism. Namely, this is the Hagrid scattering theory. And you can show that once you have one particle states, then you automatically also have multi-particle states, but these multi-particle multi states uh, can be differ for so-called incoming and outgoing states. So that's, uh, so the particle interpretation of quantum field theory is a consequence of the general axiomatic structure together with the Poincaré symmetry. Now I come to the question of uh, other representations of the vacuum representation. So uh, I already said that um, there are a lot of lots of the uh, representation, not only the vacuum representation, and you. Or, uh, or you can look at the state space, and the state space of a typical C star algebra is huge. It's just a dual part of the dual of a Banach space, and uh, this can be uh, quite quite huge. And from the point of physics, this is um, completely acceptable and not even necessary. Namely, you 
can see that this uh, that you have states which uh, do not admit an interpretation in terms of scattering of particles, but you can also have situations like condensates, you can have thermal equilibrium states, and of course, you can think of all sorts of non-equilibrium situations. So, even, so also from the point of physics, you understand that the state space must be huge, and only part of the state space is sufficiently understood and uh, has a present good physical inter interpretation. And the induced GNS representations are generically inequivalent. So one could ask the question, can we understand the representation theory of such a sister algebra? So the objects would be representations, the morphisms of the category would be intertwiners, so linear operators between the Hilbert spaces H and H prime, such that the uh, T pi of something is equal to pi prime of something like at times T. And but I think this seems impossible to make a classification in general, at least for the algebras relevant for quantum physics, quantum field theory. And at least I have not seen any useful classification. Now there is a subclass of representations, which were called the representations of interest for particle physics. And they, this subclass has been investigated by Dopplicher, Haag, and Roberts uh, from 1969 to 74. And this is the so-called DHR theory. And this is my next point. So they start from one distinguished representation, say the vacuum representation. So there should be this should be an irreducible representation and should be faithful. Then they look at other representation, which I call the following DHR representation. And these are representations which are become equivalent to the vacuum representation if you neglect some finitely extended region O. So if you restrict your observables to observables localized in the space like complement of some finitely extended region O, then this restricted representation is equivalent to the vacuum representation. So in the sense the difference from the vacuum representation is localized in a finitely extended region. Then you can, can uh, look at the space of intertwiners, which I indicated by the symbol. So these are intertwiners from the vacuum representation to the representation pi. But they depend on the region O because they uh, fulfill this intertwining relation only for observables in the space like complement of O. Now it's clear from the relation for intertwiners that the space of intertwiners is a bimodule over the algebra. Yeah, you can multiply from the right with an operator pi naught of A and on the left with an um, operator pi of A. And still, if this observable A is in the localized in the region O, then this is still an intertwiner. Now let us look at two intertwiners, fg, two intertwiners from pi naught to pi, and form the product f star times g. So this is now an operator of the Hilbert, vacuum Hilbert space to the vacuum Hilbert space. So it's an intertwiner from the vacuum representation to the vacuum representation. And by definition, it's commute, so this prime dots denotes a commutant, it commutes with all observable in this, all observables in the space like complement. Now, in particular, it commutes, uh, in particular, elements of the algebra A of O. Uh, oh, here's a typo. Here, this should be pi naught of A of O. So, so the assumption is that the algebra. The commutant of the algebra 
AFO prime is a vacuum representation is the same as the vacuum representation uh, times AFO. Or maybe I correct this immediately. Oh, it works. So, uh, so this is this uh, property of of uh, of uh, Hark, so-called Hark duality. And uh, sorry, there's a question. Yeah. The question is whether this is a consequence uh, that these are space-like, uh, O' prime and O' prime are space-like separated, whether this is an additional assumption or whether this is a consequence of... So, Hack duality is an assumption. This is an additional assumption. This equality here. So, what you automatically have is an inclusion. Yeah, so so this algebra is always this algebra is always contained in this algebra. It can certainly not be larger because of this axiom of local commutativity. But it could be smaller. And the and this assumption of factuality is in a sense that it's S large as it can be without violating the law of uh, basic commutativity. Okay, thank you. There's another question here. So, so does it mean that whenever you have two separated regions, the space like separated regions, one is finite, that you get inequivalent representations, vacuum representations? Uh, this I don't understand. So it, I will try something. Let's see whether it works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Hello. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So my question is um, because I read Unruh and talking effect. When you have um, space-like separate regions. Yeah. So one one is finite bounded. And you have another one. Does that mean, uh, say, that you have different vacuum, vacuum representations, such as in the case of the Unruh effect? Is um, that just of this? So, a space like separated in the sense that an observer, a signal from one observer, does never reach another observer? Is, 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 can, um, you, can you put it like this? Yeah. So, so so, um, I think this has not uh, nothing to do with different vacuum representations. So, so um, the situation is, okay, maybe I, I draw a picture on the... Uh, no, maybe, maybe I'm just confusing you. I'm, I, I'm sorry, but yeah. uh, I thought that would be a consequence, but uh, it, it doesn't seem obvious. Uh, it's, it's, um, I, can, I can say a little bit. So, so uh, one one thing is, if you have the Christmas, when you have these uh, assumption is of course whether this assumption is satisfied in in typical cases, and. So this was shown to hold in free field theory by Araki. Uh, 
And then there was a very general argument by Bisognano and Wichmann. This, and this was is related to the PCT theorem. But Bisognano and Wichmann did not look at a, at a finitely extended region, but on the so called wedge, so as, as in the Unruh effect. And they could show that for the for the wedge feature, this property of hard duality holds under very general conditions. And then one can construct the algebra for finite treatment by intersections of such wedges and gets a relation which this is a little bit uh, weaker than this relation here, but which for the DHR theory admits the same conclusion. And, uh, and uh, as I indicated here, uh, this observation of Bisognano and Wichmann is, uh, is related to the Unruh effect because Okay, I, um, this is another other subject, so uh, it, it's connected with the so-called Tomita Takazaki theory. Um, and in this theory, you construct an anti-unitary operator, just as in the PCT theorem, and you construct a unitary group and the unitary group is just, these are just the Lorentz boosts. And this is the relation to the Unruh effect. And the Hawking radiation is uh, just related to this when you apply the same principles to the Schwarzschild, uh, to the Schwarzschild space time. Okay, but this is, uh, um, has to be explained in more detail, but uh, I uh, uh, want to concentrate on other aspects now. So, uh, for the DHR theory, crucial is that this uh, uh, consequence of Hack duality is that these intertwiner spaces are closed under tensor products. So, as I mentioned, these intertwiner spaces are bimodules. And of course, I can form tensor products of bimodules. But what is not clear is that the tensor product of two such bimodules is again an intertwiner space for DHR representations. But due to Hack duality, this is the case. And um, I explain this here. So let Fi, Fi prime be intertwiners from the vacuum representation to the representation pi i take two vectors, phi and phi prime, in the vacuum Hilbert space, and then we form this uh, product F2 star times F2 prime, which is now an intertwiner from the vacuum representation to the vacuum representation, and by Hack duality, this is the, uh, um, of the form pi naught of A for some local observable A in the region O. And then one can form the tensor product of bimodules and take the tensor product with the vacuum Hilbert space, which is the left module, and uh, then find the scalar product on this left module. And the scalar product is defined by the following formula. So left, on the left-hand side, I have the elements of the bimodule. And on the right-hand side, I have just operators uh, in Hilbert spaces. So here, phi prime is in the vacuum Hilbert space. F1 prime maps this to the representation space of pi 1. Then I apply the representation pi 1 to the observable A and uh, form the scalar product with F1 phi, which is another vector in the Hilbert space H1. And 
one has to, of course, to check that this is a really positive semi-definite, this scalar product, but this is uh, not difficult. And then when does the usual procedure, dividing out the uh, null space and gets a new DHR representation, which is called pi 1 times pi, pi, pi 2 times pi 1. And so this is now this uh, usually called fusion. I think uh, Doppler Roberts call it composition of representations. Now, uh, actually, the structure Doppler and Hark Roberts investigate is even a little bit nicer when one takes into account certain consequences of the positivity in a condition on the energy spectrum. Um, so there is uh, the Riesch-Lieder theorem, which tells you that applying a local observable to the vacuum already creates a dense set in the vacuum Hilbert space. And there is a so-called Borchers property, which is a uh, somewhat uh, stronger version of Riesch-Lieder theorem, which yeah, if you know what von Neumann algebras uh, of type 3 are, it essentially says that these algebras are of, of, of type 3. It's not quite type 3. Uh, the statement is that if you have some non-zero projection in a local algebra, then it's equivalent to 1 in a somewhat larger algebra for a somewhat larger region. So if it's what we typed three, it would be uh, uh, in the same algebra. Now this can be used to to uh, to show that the DHR representations are actually all of the form pi naught composed with some endomorphism rho of a. This uh, is for the structure of this category of representation very nice. So you get the fusion now becomes just multiplication of endomorphisms. And what you get is a monoidal uh, category with endomorphisms as objects and intertwiners between these endomorphisms as morphisms of the category. And moreover, now you uh, can use the other structure you have, particular local commutativity local commutativity, then gives you some braiding structure. So you show that the uh, representations, um, the product of representation does not depend on the order, but when you multiply the intertwiners, then this depends on the order and the difference is given then by some unitaries and the unitaries just uh, create a representation of the break group. And one can then show if the, this uh, structure then depends on this, on the uh, form of the space-like complement of a point. So if the space-like complement of a point is connected, then you even get a representation of the permutation group. So in more than two dimensions, you find a representation of the permutation group. In the two dimensions, you would get a representation of the break group. And then, uh, in 1990, Doppler Roberts were able to show that this DHR category is equivalent to the representation category of some compact group with, with the distinguished element of order 2, which corresponds to fermions. So this is, um, uh, yeah, this is a brief survey of the doppler hack roberts theory, which now uh, is very much used in conformal field theory, where, of course, this braiding structure becomes very important, which was not investigated by doppler hack roberts They concentrated on dimension four at that time, just uh, believe that physics takes place in four dimensions. Okay, so 
this is what I wanted to tell about the Dr. Jack Roberts theory. Of course, one could give lecture series on this, so this is only a brief overview. Now I come to a, another aspect, which is called locally covariant quantum field theory. So as I said, um, um, the, the uh, particle aspects of uh, quantum field theory are very much connected with Poincaré symmetry. And the question is, what can one do if one has an external gravitational field? Then we would expect that we have a space-time with some non-trivial curvature. And in order to have ordinary causal properties, uh, I assume here that the space-time is globally hyperbolic, which means that it has a Cauchy surface, so the surface which is met by every causal curve, which cannot be prolonged exactly once. And the you try to generalize the Hakasta axioms to, to this situation. Of course, when you look at the inclusion, this is of no problem, and all the local commutativity is okay because of this uh, global hyperbolicity. You can also formulate the covariance axiom, but the difficulty with the covariance axiom is that it becomes trivial in the generic case. And this is, of course, a big difference because you have much less structure. And this has a lot of bad consequences, namely, you don't know what the vacuum is, because the vacuum was defined by Poincaré symmetry. It was invariant under Poincaré transformation, so if we don't have a symmetry group, what is a vacuum? And moreover, what are particles? So this definition of uh, Wigner that you characterize particles by representations of the Poincaré group does not work. But what, what then? And um, actually, this is an, uh, this this is a situation which is still present now. So I think the situation is that there is no good definition of a vacuum and no good definition of a particle on a generic uh, globally hyperbolic space time. There is another difficulty which comes when you really work, try to work out a given model. Namely, typically in quantum field theory, you find a lot of singularities, divergences in Feynman graphs, uh, Feynman integrals, and so on. Even when you try to define products of fields, you have a lot of singularities. Now, um, in Minkowski space, you typically treat these uh, by going to the momentum space and making some cutoff and uh, try to uh, subtract divergent contributions and so on. When you want to do this on a curved background, you need other techniques, but these techniques exist. So there's a microlocal analysis, which in a sense is some kind of local Fourier transform. And you can study the singularities, you can remove them. But the problem is, in the absence of symmetry, you do this for every point of space-time independently. So when you do renormalization, you usually have some freedom, which you have to fix by renormalization conditions. But here you would have the freedom to choose these renormalization conditions for each point independently, which of course would be a disaster for making predictions. So this was the uh, situation, say, up to 2000. And there, in an Oberwolfach meeting, a new concept was created, which is called locally covariant quantum field theory. And I mentioned here a few of the people who contributed to this. Now, um, 
Uh, in particular, I want to emphasize that Bernard K did something on the Casimir effect many years ago, which is almost always all, uh, which is uh, which is uh, in the same spirit and which, in a sense, is also a motivation for doing this in this way. Okay, I will explain what this means. So, in this concept, you consider quantum field theory as a functor, a functor from uh, the category of globally hyperbolic space times of a fixed dimension. And so these are the objects of the category and the, the arrows are the causality preserving isometric embeddings. The causality preserving means to keep the time direction and moreover if points are uh, causally related in the image, then they should, then they are also already causally related in the original manifold. There, you, uh, there are no, uh, the embedding does not produce new causal relations. And the, uh, the other category is the category of C-star algebra with unit. And there, of course, the uh, morphisms are Unital homomorphisms, and usually we take monomorphisms or injective uh, homomorphisms. But uh, okay, this uh, uh, has to be uh, somewhat modified if you consider gauge theories and more complicated uh, topological situations. Now, this uh, uh, this functor has to satisfy an, an axiom which is related to the axiom of local commutativity, which takes the form, the following form. So you take two embeddings of space times mi into a space sum n, such that the images are space-like to each other. And then the corresponding algebras should, uh, the, the, the corresponding uh, elements of the different algebras should commute. So it's just the translation of the locality assumption uh, as in the uh, Hakasla net. And then, of course, when you restrict this uh, framework to globally hyperbolic subregions of a fixed space time, then you just get a Hakasla net. And the nice feature is that. Uh, in spite of the fact that it is more general than the Arcaster net, it's simpler yeah, than the covariance axiom and the inclusion axiom follow both from the functoriality of this functor A. Yeah, so, so you have an automatically covariant uh, theory. So there's a question. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit how uh, covariance follows from this? not very intuitive at first. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe... Oh, no, it's, uh, uh, okay, so... so, so, um, so, so you have an... Uh, if you have a symmetry, then this is the map from the space-time into its life. And the symmetry is... Uh, fulfills these conditions, so this is a morphism of the category. Yeah, then you get, you get an, an uh, homomorphism of the algebra into itself. Yeah? And, uh, and this, uh, and by the functoriality, uh, you can compose this morphism. So you get, get a representation of the symmetry group. Yeah, so, so, you, so these monomorphisms become automorphisms of the algebra of uh, the fixed space time. And uh, they are automatically uh, form a representation. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Now, uh, we want also to have the property that um, in the theory there is a deterministic dynamical law. Uh, this is also true for the Kastler framework, that one should also add this axiom to, um, uh, to, to have a deterministic law. This is a so-called time slice axiom. And the time slice axiom uh, has the following form. So we, if you have an embedding of your space M, M into an other space M N, such as the image under chi contains a Cauchy surface of the uh, space M N. Then these, the, uh, the, the image of A of M under the homomorphism A chi should be the full algebra, not only contained, but should be the full algebra A of N. This is a time slice axiom. And the same can be also uh, formulated for the original Hakasla net. Actually, in the Hakasla net, uh, framework, they call it primitive causality, which is, I think, not a very good name. So time slice axiom is, in a sense, better. It's a name coming from Whiteman. Um, so, so you can can assume, take this as an additional assumption, which just uh, says that you have uh, unique. This corresponds to the idea that you have some you, that you have unique solutions of the initial value problem in classical field theory. Now, such embeddings have been called Cauchy or Cauchy. Cauchy morphisms, and they can be considered as weak equivalences in the sense of category theory. In particular, we can look at their formal inverses, which then become uh, really inverses after applying the functor A to it. So when, then you can have close paths of weak equivalences, so you move from one manifold to another manifold, and and back, and this is then induces automorphisms which describe intermediate changes of the metric. And uh, when you do this uh, uh, infinitesimally, you just describe the action of the energy momentum tensor. And because the full framework is general covariant, you find that when you uh, do the change of the metric by a diffeomorphism, compactly supported diffeomorphism, then nothing changes, and this produces the covariant conservation law for the energy momentum tensor. Okay, so this is this framework, and uh, I uh, can say that using this framework, one can then perturbatively construct quantum field theory on curved space-time. This has been done by Monetti, myself, and by uh, Hollands and Wald. And uh, then um, it gives a um, theory which looks quite similar to the Minkowski space theory. So you have similar uh, renormalization ambiguities. Um, the, the, but there is a problem which up to now is not so well understood. This is a problem of the classification of states because it's not clear um, how to select a nice class of states corresponding to the particle states uh, which uh, one does in the Minkowski space theory. So there's still a lot of discussion what are good states in such a situation, and uh, I think the answer is presently unknown. Okay, so this is what I wanted to tell today. Tomorrow I will then come to another problem, namely how to specify a given theory. So these are it's an axiomatic characterization of the framework, but does not specify a given theory. So tomorrow I will concentrate on ways of specifying 
the given theory in this framework. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, just so that there's no confusion, uh, the next lecture will be uh, the, on the day after tomorrow, on Thursday, right? On oh, Thursday. Oh, I I'm <laughs> was thinking Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, you still have one more time preparing everything. So I should okay. not make other plans for Thursday. Uh, I would suggest that we start with the questions from the lecture hall, and I was asked that I should mute the microphone while the, while the question is answered. Probably there's some echo that we don't hear here. So we start with the questions here and then they take the online questions afterwards. Okay, there's a question. So it, should I repeat it or? Okay. So the question is whether uh, on singular space, singular space, singular space times, everything works outside of the singularity. Is that essentially, whenever you don't meet the singularity, then everything should exist and be defined. Um. Yeah. So. 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 So one needs this assumption of global hyperbolicity. So when you have a global, globally hyperbolic subregion of a space-time, then all these um, um, framework, the framework works fine. Of course, singularities are not uh, allowed in this framework, and it's not clear how to treat singularities. But outside of singularities, everything is okay, provided you keep global hyperbolicity. If you don't have global hyperbolicity, then you get new phenomena. Some of them are understood. For instance, when you have time-like boundaries, you can um, impose certain boundary conditions. But um, there are also cases, for instance, when you have closed time-like curves, then the whole framework collapses, because nothing is then uh, causally independent from each other, so it's not clear how to do reasonable quantum physics in such a situation. Any other further questions? Yes. So <clears throat> you explained before that uh, if there's no symmetries, if there are no symmetries of space-time, there is a, a priori a problem about randomization, how to fix it at uh, different points, and why is this overcome now in this framework? Yeah, that's an interesting phenomenon. It comes from this freedom of um, embedding space-times into each other. Of course, um, there's this restriction that you uh, admit only embeddings which have, which uh, um, um, uh, preserve the metric and the causal structure, but the space times which you embed can be arbitrarily small. So the, at the end only the germ uh, enters in the, the, the germ of the metric enters. And of course, when you do this in perturbation theory, then you replace the germ by some jet of finite order. And so you, uh, for instance, when you asked uh, for the question finding a tensor, which is uh, transforms in the correct way under all these embeddings, and you in addition qu uh, require that the tensor um, depends only on on the metric and its first derivatives, then you get the Einstein tensor, if you want to have a conserved tensor, or the metric tensor it's, uh, itself, yeah, but, so you, this is the reason for Einstein's equations, this is a simple equation you can write down, 
for for uh, uh, conserved energy momentum tensor. And a similar idea is uh, for the renormalization. Of course, you need this additional assumption that the singularities are not arbitrarily large. So you have a theory which has, say, phi to the four, renormalizable theory, and then you require that in all the singularities only the first orders or the second orders of the metric, of the derivatives of the metric enter. And then um, you, you see that this um, these condition on the uh, on the that the embeddings are homomorphisms uh, already fix everything up to things which depend on say the curvature and maybe first derivatives of the curvature of the matter uh, uh, of the of the space time. So of course there is uh, so in the in the abstract framework you would only have control over the germs, but when you enrich this by requirements on the degrees of singularities, then you get really finite, finite corrections only. 